And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, up until this point in Matthew's gospel, Jesus has been kind of a one-man show. And so far, we've seen him preaching the Sermon on the Mount. We've seen him healing droves of people with various illnesses. We've seen him casting out demons. We've even seen him calming a storm. And although he's already called all of his closest disciples by this point in the narrative, they have been mostly in the background following and learning from Jesus until now. In the text that we're looking at today, you might say that the 12 disciples that Jesus has called to himself are finally being activated. So the time of passive instruction is over, and although Jesus does have a lot more to teach them before the day of his death, they are now going to be expected to actively participate in the ministry that he has been modeling for them. What we're considering today is the commissioning of the 12 apostles and how that commissioning relates to us as modern-day Christians. Last week, we looked at the first half of chapter 9, and we saw some very prominent aspects of Jesus' ministry, including the fact that he would often associate with sinners and tax collectors, the most despised people in Jewish society. We also saw embedded in another healing miracle the chief reason for why Jesus came into the world, and that is to forgive repentant human beings of their sins to restore us to a right relationship with God. And in just one verse, we saw the calling of one of the most prominent disciples who also happens to be the author of the book that we're reading now. With the calling of Matthew, it seems that Jesus now has his team assembled, and he's going to refer to this particular group of 12 disciples as apostles. So for today's message, we're going to seek to answer two main questions from the text. Number one, why does Jesus commission apostles? We see that answered in verses not, chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And then number two, what does Jesus commission the apostles to do? And we see that answered in chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. And in answering those questions, I pray that we'll have a better understanding of what we are supposed to do as modern disciples and ministers of Jesus. So, as I mentioned up to this point in Matthew's gospel, Jesus has basically been flying solo in his earthly ministry. And we can see a summary of that ministry there in verse 35 of chapter 9. It says again, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Jesus was a busy man. And although he was and is God, he was also a human being. And as I'm sure that you're well aware, human beings have limitations. He could only be in one place at a time. And if he spent his entire day ministering to people, he became tired. So as Bilbo Baggins once lamented, he felt like butter scraped over too much bread. 
But Jesus felt compelled to continue ministering to those who needed him, yet he knew that he couldn't do it alone. In verses 36 through 38, we read, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, let's not miss this point. When Jesus looks at the world, what he has for it is compassion. He does not turn a blind eye to those who are hurting, to those who have issues of various kinds, to those who are helpless or hopeless. He sees the pain of the world, and he grieves for the world. But remember that the main purpose of Jesus' ministry is to lead people to repentance from their sins and into a right relationship with God. That is much more important than any of the physical issues that they might have. And that's probably what's being referred to here where it says that the crowds were like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep are both dumb and defenseless. They are dumb in the sense that they need someone to lead them in the right direction. Otherwise, they'll just wander off or even walk right off of a cliff. They are defenseless in the sense that they have no natural defenses against predators that many other animals do have. They don't have fangs or claws. They can't run very fast and not very agile. Therefore, they're especially susceptible to attack. So if a large number of sheep are to stay together as a group and to remain safe from predators, then they need a shepherd, someone who could lead them and look after them. And like it or not, throughout Scripture, God's people are often compared to sheep. We are sheep who need a shepherd. And of course, the only one that can rightfully be called our shepherd is God. In that famous first verse of Psalm 23, it says that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Then in the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd. And in the book of Hebrews, he's referred to as the great shepherd. So Jesus is our great shepherd who has come to care for God's flock. But the remarkable thing that we see in this text is that even though Jesus is the shepherd, he chooses to commission under shepherds for the task of earthly ministry. And that fits with the metaphor that he uses there in verse 36. But he also uses another metaphor in verses 37 and 38, where he talks about the harvest being plentiful and there being a need for laborers to be sent out into the harvest. Usually when the Bible uses the metaphor of a harvest, it's in reference to God's judgment. But in this particular case, Jesus is talking about all those in Israel who are spiritually ready to be brought into the household of God. The Jewish people had been harassed by various empires. They had been exiled and then brought back again into their homeland. And many had simply gone astray from the Lord. And Jesus saw that there were so many people that needed to be brought back into the fold of God that he, in his humanity, couldn't do it alone. Therefore, he says that he needs under-shepherds and co-laborers to accomplish that mission. And his, as he addresses his closest disciples here, he first of all tells them to pray. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. What he's basically saying here is pray for missions. Pray for those who are seeking out and ministering to the lost and especially pray for more believers to fill their ranks. Well, that was the first task of the original disciples, and that's our first task as well. The Christian church needs more missionaries, both foreign and domestic. There are nations and people groups of the world that have very little, if any, exposure to the gospel. Therefore, more faithful believers must go to those places, and sometimes for a lifetime of ministry. Very practically, what we can do at New Covenant is to pray for the missionaries that we know and support as a church. So keep Wilson Joseph in India and Travis and Sophie in Israel constantly in your prayers. They are doing very difficult work and even putting their lives in danger in order to spread the gospel. Our financial support for them is important, but our prayers for them are even more important. But I don't think that we should limit our prayers to just those who are engaged in foreign missions. We should be in prayer for anyone that we know who is in some form of ministry, either far away or close to home. And we should be in prayer that more people would choose to devote their lives to full-time ministry. 
I don't know the exact figures, but if seminary enrollment is any indication, then there are much less young people choosing to go into vocational ministry than there were just a couple of decades ago. Pray that God would send workers into the harvest. Pray that seminaries would not have to close their doors or that missions organizations would not have to fold due to a lack of interest or support. But given that command to pray for under-shepherds and laborers to go out into the world, we should not think that the work of ministry should only be left to those who are called to do it full-time. Rather, the work of ministry is for every single follower of Jesus. And that doesn't mean that every person is called to be a pastor or a missionary, but it does mean that we are ministers wherever we find ourselves. You are the hands and the feet and the mouth of Jesus wherever you go. So whatever profession or whatever kind of role you're in right now is a form of ministry. Before we get into what it is that a minister is supposed to do, we first need to realize that we are indeed ministers of Jesus in this world, no matter what our current title or role is. Ministry is not just for the professionals. So to sum up this first section of our text today, we must pray for the missions and missionaries of the Christian church. And we must be on mission ourselves as followers of Jesus. The world is a dark place full of lost people. And we've been called to lead people into the light in the name of Jesus. Moving on now to the first part of chapter 10, we can see the commissioning of the 12 disciples, starting there in verse 1. It says again, And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. So by this point in Jesus' ministry, he already seems to have a massive following. But within the mass of people who called themselves his disciples were the disciples that he had handpicked, a few of which we've already read about. We read about the calling of Peter, his brother Andrew, and also James and John back in chapter 4. And of course, last week we read about Matthew's calling from his tax booth in chapter 9. Some of the other gospel accounts go into more detail about the calling of the other disciples, But Matthew assumes that we already know about that, so by this point in the narrative, Jesus has already called all 12 of his disciples together. And up till now, they've simply been following and learning from Jesus. But now Jesus gathers them around himself to commission them to go out and do the same sort of ministry that he had been doing. We see there in verse 1 that he gives them authority to heal and to cast out demons but we'll get more of a full description of that further down in the passage. Before we get to that, we need to note a couple of interesting things about the first part of verse 2, which says the names of the 12 apostles are these, and then he lists the names. With Peter at the head of the list and then Judas Iscariot at the tail of the list. That's always how they're listed. The two words that I want to highlight here are the word 12 and the word apostles. Jesus calls 12 of his disciples to be his inner circle, most likely because they represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, I don't think that we should take from that that each of the disciples were called from descendants of each of the 12 tribes. Rather, the number itself was symbolic of all Israel and representative of the fact that Jesus was now in the process of creating a new Israel, which is the church. The old Israel was composed of Jews who had either fallen away or been scattered throughout, throughout the centuries. But the new Israel be, would be one that was not defined by national borders or ethnic identity, but by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, it would start with the Jewish people, which is why every one of the apostles were ethnic Jews, but it would quickly expand to include people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Peter Lightheart says it well when he writes that the apostles are the root of the new tree of Israel, the first spark of the new Israel that will be a light to the nations. So a major part of Jesus' earthly ministry was to constitute a new Israel around himself so that they could then bless the nations just as the Old Testament prophets had prophesied. The other word that should draw our attention is the word apostles. Verse 2 in chapter 10 is the only place where this word is used in Matthew's gospel. But of course, it's used in various other places in the New Testament. 
After the death and resurrection of Jesus, it seems that the word apostle was used in a technical sense to mark out those who were part of Jesus' inner circle who had witnessed his resurrection body. And even though Paul wasn't a part of the original 12, he would see the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus, so he would become an honorary apostle. But before that point in time, the word apostle seemed to have a much looser meaning. The Greek word literally means sent one. And we see that's precisely what Jesus is doing here with the 12 disciples. He's sending them out. And from this moment on, they would be considered his primary group of disciples who would follow him all the way up to his final days. But in this particular instance, we can see that he's commissioning them to go on a very specific mission. We read again in verses 5 through 8. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without paying. So first of all, we need to make some sense of what Jesus is telling them to do there in verses 5 and 6. Now, given what I just said about the apostles as the new Israel blessing all the nations of the world, It might be surprising to see that Jesus is limiting their ministry to only Jewish lands, and even more specifically to the Jews that lived in the northern region of Israel, which was called Galilee. Now, we've already seen Jesus interacting with and even healing various people who were Gentiles. And then at the very end of Matthew's gospel, we're going to see Jesus commission his disciples to go out into all nations, not just within the confines of Israel. So it's not as if he wanted to withhold his ministry from non-Jews. Rather, it seems that during the short time of Jesus' earthly ministry, his primary goal was to reach the Jewish people with the gospel. It made sense that the reconstitution of the new Israel would begin with the old Israel. God's old covenant people would have the privilege of being the first to hear the good news about Jesus. And that was Jesus' primary concern during the duration of his time 2,000 years ago on this earth. And that's the primary concern that he has here as he commissions the apostles for that particular mission. So this was to be a limited mission in many respects. It was to be limited in its duration. We can see the disciples regrouping again in a couple of chapters. And it was to be limited in scope only to the Jews in Galilee. And there was also a certain amount of urgency to their mission. It seems that Jesus wanted the apostles to be quick and efficient with their ministry efforts, not spending much time in any one area, and not bothering with the various things that people usually take with them on a long journey. So from a practical standpoint, I don't think that we should take Jesus' instructions to his disciples here as a basis for how all ministry endeavors should go. First of all, the authority and the abilities Jesus granted to his disciples in this instance are not normally given to disciples in general. Unless God wants to do something really abnormal through you, you're not going to have the ability to miraculously heal people or raise people from the dead. Those abilities were for that particular time for those particular disciples. Now, that doesn't mean that miraculous things can't happen nowadays but that's not normally how God operates through his disciples after the time of the New Testament. Secondly, the urgency with which Jesus was commissioning his disciples on this mission and the need to completely rely on the hospitality of others is not something that's absolutely required or even in some cases feasible for most ministry efforts. He says there in verses 9 and 10, "...acquire no gold, nor silver, nor copper for your belts." No bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. So he's telling him there to not only move fast, but also to move lightly. Don't bring provisions with you because you should be able to rely on the hospitality of others. The apostles would have to have, to have absolute dependence on God to provide for their physical needs which should remind us of that line in the Lord's Prayer, which says, give us this day our daily bread. So most of that may not be applicable or even required for how we do missions and ministry on a normal basis. But I think that there is a principle that we can gain from this. 
And that is that we can become so concerned with making sure everything is in place and that we have all of the necessary funds for this or that ministry endeavor and enough training and enough support that we stall doing what God is telling us to do right now. It's good to make plans and to be responsible with our finances and to make provisions for the long haul. But at the end of the day, we have to trust in God. If God is calling us to do something, then he will provide a way for us to do it. So in this instance, the apostles are to rely completely on the Lord through the hospitality of strangers as they minister and share the gospel throughout Galilee. And this is not going to be their permanent job, so they're not to receive any payment for it. The only payment they should receive is food and lodging for each day. And the way in which the various people receive them is going to be very crucial. In verses 11 through 15, Jesus says, And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave the house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. So we can see here that Jesus' disciples had a great responsibility, but those who received his disciples had an even greater one. To receive a disciple of Jesus, to treat them with hospitality, and ultimately to listen to their message was like receiving Jesus himself. If they were received well, then the people would be blessed, and perhaps they'd be saved through the gospel. But if they were treated poorly or rejected, then those who did so would receive divine judgment. Most likely not immediate judgment, but certainly judgment on the last day. Which is why he says there in verse 15 that that judgment would be even worse than the physical destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We read about those two towns uh, in the book of Genesis that God destroyed because of their lack of hospitality. So the disciples are bearers of God's good news, but also in a more indirect way, they're bearers of God's judgment, which brings us back to that harvest metaphor again. The disciples of Jesus go out into the world and separate the wheat from the chaff by their very presence and by the message that they proclaim. Some will reject it and some will accept it. And in doing so, each person determines their own eternal destiny. So that's the 12 disciples' initial foray into the apostolic calling. They were making the transition from being merely learners of Jesus to being doers of what he had taught them. And of course, each of us should seek that same kind of mindset as well. In the formal sense, there are no more apostles. They died off more than 2,000 years ago, not long after Jesus himself died. But in the broader sense, God has called every member of his church to be an apostle, to be a sent one. When you become a believer in Jesus, you are simultaneously commissioned or sent by God to go out into the world and make more disciples. Your discipleship is not simply composed of you hiding away somewhere and reading the Bible, as attractive as that might sound to introverts like me. Rather, we are all called, regardless of our natural abilities or even how long we've been a Christian, to go out and share the gospel and to seek out people who are hurting or lost with our help. And that is a very high responsibility. And while we should take it seriously, we should also remember that it's ultimately God's work, not ours. We're just agents or vessels of the Holy Spirit. Our only task is to be willing and obedient. If we share the gospel or we share our testimony with a lost person and they just kind of shrug their shoulders or they even outright reject us, that's okay. We did our part. We can't force that person to believe. And if that person continues to reject us, then we shake the dust from our feet and we move on to the next person. Ultimately, God is the one who saves souls, not us. And when we really allow that to sink in, it's free because we don't have anything to lose. Someone else's salvation is not hanging on how well I can share the gospel or how I say the right things, or even if I'm sound theologically. It all depends on God. Therefore, we should depend on God the way the original disciples did as we go out into the world. The world might reject us and mock us and even persecute us, but that's okay because we know our standing with God. We know that he is the great shepherd 
And we have the privilege of being his children and his under-shepherds until he calls us home. 